This is London Real. I am Brian Rose. My guest today is Professor Dolores Cahill, the Irish immunologist, molecular biologist, and medical researcher. You are an expert on pathogenic viruses and vaccines, with your academic work being cited over 5,900 times. You've been a member of the Advisory Science Council to the Irish government and a member of the International Science Advisory Board. You pioneered research at the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Genetics in Berlin and hold several international patents in biomarker diversity, diagnostics, and personalized medicine. Throughout the global coronavirus pandemic, you've been campaigning to end lockdowns and the unnecessary erosion of our freedoms. Instead, you advocate the use of proven science to overcome this crisis. Professor Cahill, welcome to London Real. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure. Great having you here. Before we get started, I just want to announce to everyone that we are streaming now on our brand new digital freedom platform, a censorship-free independent broadcasting system that is of the people, by the people, for the people, and available exclusively on our website at freedomplatform.tv. Can everyone watching us now please share this link via the sidebar to any and all of your social media channels? Let me repeat that. Can everyone watching us please share this link now via the sidebar to all your social media channels? This is important. Just ask your friends and family to give us 15 minutes and they can decide. Professor Cahill, I pledge to you and everyone watching us that none of this conversation will be edited, censored, removed, or banned, and that anyone in the world can watch the full version of this episode free at londonreal.tv forward slash Cahill. Thanks to the generous donations of over 31,000 people around the world, we affectionately call the London Real Army, of which you are one, Professor. For anyone wanting... One. You are. <laughs> I love it. Uh, for, for anyone else who wants to become a founding member of the Digital Freedom Platform, they can visit freedomplatform.tv forward slash give to donate and fight with us on the front lines to protect our human rights. Here at London Real, we've been a platform for free speech since 2011. And Professor Cahill, I'm excited to have you here today. Uh, I don't know where to start, but I probably do because I think we share uh, the fact that we've been censored. Uh, both of us have had some of our ideas censored on some of these big technology platforms. And I kind of want to jump in and talk about that because honestly, Dolores, up until April 6th, nothing I had ever said was ever censored. You know, no one in the news had ever said things about me. No one had whispered behind my back, you know. But now, once I was censored, I feel like I've kind of gone into this other world and now I'm surrounded by people that, that it's kind of normal to have their work talked about in a strange way. And uh, it's, been, it's been fascinating for me to observe. And also not very fun to know that when I speak something out of my mouth, other people can say it's dangerous for other people to hear it. So I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts. Um, again, thank you so much for being a founding member of the Digital Freedom Platform. It means so much. You know, we can speak freely here. And um, it's hard to emphasize how important that is because if, if, if this I suppose, was... I, I totally agree. And I suppose what we, if people wouldn't be aware that there is an issue in science around differences of opinions in a number of areas. So people might be aware of it maybe in the UK about say, if you want to say there's a biological difference between men and women, 
or if you want to challenge the debate around carbon dioxide and climate change that has been going on for about 15 years. So because I've come across these issues on, in my work in the universities and on the government advisory science councils, that's what encouraged me to speak up now when it comes to coronavirus, because essentially what we are being told is not how the immune system works. And they are trying to push a narrative that is not based on the decades of immunology. And when you see it in the light of around uh, free speech or building false consensuses in science, then you can see how the media and who is interviewed on, we'll say, the BBC or big stations are actually not reflective of the science. And if we don't speak up, they are going to impose a new narrative which is not true. So I also um, set up a party called Irish Freedom. Uh, I've been involved in setting it up. And I've been advocating free speech and open debate for all issues in society. So that's what encouraged me to speak up now. Yeah, and I really appreciate the work you've done for that. I know you've run for office as well without any media support. And, um, you know, I never realized how much I valued freedom of speech until this happened. But my, my gut reaction, my knee-jerk reaction in my DNA, Dolores, was, no, this is not okay. And that's what we've been on this fight for the past two months to, to, to create our own platform so we can have these conversations. Because, you know, I grew up in, in California and in, in America in the 70s as a kid, you could say whatever you want. You could talk about the president. You can do anything. And, and so the fact we can't speak about science um, makes me even more kind of enraged. And I have a science background as well. But le let me get this right, Dolores. Since you've been in the science community, you know there's a tendency in science and research and academia to kind of push unpopular ideas kind of away or down below the surface. And so when this came out with coronavirus, you had been used to this kind of behavior and you said not this time i need to talk about it is that correct yeah exactly so i suppose i invented or co-invented with my team high content protein arrays back in 1996-97 and one of the first applications of that was to look at antibodies that were used in research and antibodies are used in diagnostic tests to diagnose disease and sometimes quite serious diseases like autoimmune diseases and cancer so when we applied our technology, we were screening thousands more proteins. We were getting very good results. But when we were telling the scientific collaborators that no, what you've published is incorrect, there was a lot of reluctance within the scientific community to actually correct the record, which they could have easily done because this was a new technology. So that brought me in for 20 years around research integrity and how a lot of the publications in science may not be true and that I have been on volunteering and unpaid on the Government Advisory Science Council and in the EU to try and move towards validation of science results and that careers should be promoted based on people putting their results and data and antibodies into open repositories so that other people can check the data. And this would enrich science. And because there's been a lot of reluctance from the funding agencies and the governments, a lot of the scientific papers are based on tools and research that are not true. And actually, I've been considering getting out of science. And that's, I think, why a lot of the clinical trials are failing, because a lot of the tools and a lot of the publications are not validated and may be incorrect. So I was able to then look at what was going on in the coronavirus, and the whole narrative is false. And maybe just for the few people who might stay for the first 15 minutes, I would like to say to them, it is very confusing. They are getting conflicting messages from eminent scientists. But from my perspective, I am saying we don't need the lockdown. We don't need masks. We don't need social distancing. Eat well, boost your immune system. There are preventative measures and talk to your doctors to get early and effective treatments like hydroxychloroquine and zinc. And we can re-engage in the world within a week. There is no need for the lockdown no need for any of these new societal changes. Businesses, tourist industry, schools can open and we can go back to work. The question people will ask right away is, then how do we get here? How do we get into this mess with, you know, apparently intelligent people at the helm? You know, how do we get to this crazy lockdown environment, to this, these figures around the world of six million cases and hundreds of thousands of deaths, apparently because of COVID-19? How did it happen? So I suppose that's why the carbon dioxide climate change debate is actually very interesting because what happens is now that you have scientific areas emerging 
which are not challenged and based on false premises. And then funding agencies, you know, start a funding application with, for example, carbon dioxide is the biggest driver of climate change, which it isn't. And so if you, a lot of the money is funded into an area, and if you don't agree with that premise and write a grant with that premise, you won't get funding, and then you won't get publications, and you won't get a promotion. So what's going on now and why we're here is a lot of the governments worldwide do not have scientific advisors that are actually where they challenge each other. So what I'm saying as a lesson from the lockdown is we need to have open debates with you know, representation on public forum like the BBC or Channel 4, where before you would have a lockdown, you would give you know, equal time to various scientists with different opinions, and, and then that the governments would be informed for the pros and cons of the lockdown and why some of the data that the lockdown is built on, it came out very quickly that it was incorrect. And so what questions need to be asked is, why didn't they stop the lockdown weeks ago? They had coronavirus. You're probably one of the few people I've had on the show that's actually gone through it. I, and I, it feels like that's relevant. Can you tell us about that experience and what, what we can learn from it? Well, my husband went to America through Heathrow in December and in January, and he had a very severe cough and he's asthmatic. So it was unusual symptoms of breathlessness towards the end. And I got it in January and February. So it was a very severe cough. And I've had pneumonia before, but it was actually a dry cough. And I became breathless for a few days at the end. And then I recovered. I was fine. Of course, if I had known now, I would have supplemented myself with vitamin D, C, and zinc and rested more. But it, you know, it was severe, but it turns out now we know there are preventions and treatments so that actually you wouldn't actually need to have the symptoms. And maybe it's good to say that about half or 60% or 70% of people that will come across the coronavirus will have no symptoms at all. Okay, and now that means, in your belief, that you will not get it again. No, so one of these, the coronaviruses are ones where the immune system gets activated and you clear the virus and you are immune for life. And how we know that is that in animal studies, you can look for the presence of the virus once the immune system works and there is no virus there in the animal models. And also some of the tests for the presence of the virus are PCR tests and they are negative once your immune system kicks in, which takes two or three weeks. Do you think we'll look back on this in say 25 years after we've done I mean, I guess I use the word autopsy. I don't know what the equivalent is when, you know, maybe they can study all the genetic strains. They can go back through all the records, you know, after all the Freedom of Information Act comes back. And we'll look at this as one of the, the strangest times in human history where everybody kind of duped themselves into behaving in a completely irrational way. Or do you think it'll be covered up as a real pandemic? I think it's one of the biggest mistakes of the millennium probably, or the biggest mistake of the century, and why I've been calling for public inquiries into it, is that it's very clear how we ended up here. It's that the governments you know, relied on advice, one or two voices, and that was they were scared or intimidated by the media, and also global organizations like the World Health Organization, where there is no democratic accountability, perpetuated the fear. And that's why we have to learn lessons because this pandemic, what I had said in the beginning is, why did they, it looked like Wuhan and the Lombardy region and New York were outliers of very high deaths. And what the epidemiologists should have been doing in January and February before it even came to Europe is to say, how come there's hardly any deaths in Japan or in South Korea or in Taiwan? What is different? And I think definitely we will find out it's either the age profile or it might have been prior vaccination or other in, um, environmental issues. But really, the death rate around the world is in the range of a normal influenza virus, and there is nothing to be afraid of. And I think we will learn a lot from why there were so many deaths in Wuhan and in Italy and in New York. Do you think it'll be a combination of those things? You said age profile, form of vaccination, and maybe toxicology in the environment. And I think what people should know is that 40% of the time, the influenza-like symptoms are caused by coronaviruses. Right. And so you, you can clear those viruses, you know, and become immune. 
I think Dr. Sherry Tempenny said that, that when, when flu is reported, it's, it's not necessarily the flu, it's flu-like symptoms. So every year, the, the flu, when it's reported, has percentages of coronavirus in that. Is that correct? So it's just that there are different families of viruses. So the influenza virus that we call flu or influenza is only 10 to 15% of the time that people have flu-like symptoms. And 40% of the time it's caused by coronaviruses. And the common cold is also caused by coronaviruses. So I think there will actually be less deaths now due to flu, because if we get our message out, people will be informed that you can actually boost your immune system by vitamins D, C, and zinc in the flu season so that actually we can have less deaths overall for other years. And also hydroxychloroquine and zinc in the preventative dose, it has a half-life of 21 days so that anyone who has a low immune system or is vulnerable can actually take the preventative dose of zinc and hydroxychloroquine and will actually be able to engage with these coronaviruses and they won't make them sick at all. So we can actually reduce the burden of illness as well as death now from this experience of coronavirus. So that is good news. No, that is good. I'd love to get into that a little bit more detail a little bit later. So if I'm trying to understand the way you see the world is this, this, this virus breaks out in Wuhan, we start getting information and there's a few people at the top that kind of have a vested interest in things either remaining the same or a certain narrative just staying consistent. And maybe that's people at the WHO or the CDC or someone like Fauci who's next to Trump. And they just kind of say, all right, we're gonna go along with this narrative. And when a few politicians get involved, which ultimately they kind of want to protect their job and you know they have to trust the scientists, they also don't want to make, make a major mistake. You're saying this just kind of got forced through until everyone accepted it, then the fear came in and then people would do any one anyone said. Am I far off with kind of getting the Dolores concept of what happened? I suppose the Dolores concept, why I'm speaking up, is that what's not really highlighted enough is that if you eat well and you avoid stress and you boost your immune system, you actually won't be sick from a lot of viruses. So that's a very different narrative. So it turns out that historically, over more than 100 years, they were two schools of thought, the germ theory and the terrain theory, and they were done by Pasteur and Belchamp. And one of the theories would be, for me, the Belchamp theory would be that if you are well and not stressed, you're, and you have good nutrients and good food, you can fight off any virus. Your immune system is working. And therefore, viruses are not something to be afraid of. And, but nobody really makes any money out of that because you're talking about healthy food, no stress and nutrition, which is really my message and a lot of the people. But unfortunately, for the last hundred years or so, the Pasteur germ theory around viruses and infection, where they have war-like you know, analogies and it's an outbreak, uh, you know, and you need to get antibiotics to defend yourself against it, as if you don't have a natural immune system, that is the kind of education and narrative that doctors have been taught in medical schools and that the only way to recover from these viruses or infections is through antibiotics or vaccines. Is that so what really we have is a hundred year discussion about how is best to keep healthy. And this has really come head on with the coronavirus because if the vaccine is the only cure, then you have to lock down the country until the vaccine comes. You don't really have any way that you yourself can, can prevent yourself getting sick. Um, and then you, you have to shield yourself from the virus by wearing masks and you have to social distance and you have to keep children from playing with each other and you have to prevent you know, football games and concerts. So that's a very consistent narrative if you want to say that health comes out of a vaccine and we have to lock down. And why it's difficult for people like me and others to even engage with people who have been taught that in the medical schools for maybe two or three generations is they haven't been taught about the immune system and that we evolved with these viruses and bacteria. And if we have a healthy immune system, we don't need anything else. Is that part of the reason, I mean, is the medical system or the medical education system is that because a lot of that is, is paid for by studies funded by pharmaceutical companies? Or is it just because 100 years ago, we got into this narrative of, like you said, 
we're at war and you have to fortify your immune system and I mean what is it what created this status quo where you you get a, if you don't get a pill when you go to your doctor you feel like you got you, you got a raw deal right if you go to your doctor like a year ago before coronavirus and you said oh I'm feeling sick and they'd be like well go home eat healthy and sleep and you'll be okay in about 10 days you do you feel like wait a second where's my antibiotics where's my this where's my that I mean how did we all get into this narrative so you can actually trace the narrative by the Rockefeller Foundation who set up a series of medical schools and then they also set up the licensing of medical doctors across America and the world and there there was an awful lot of traditional healing in food you know and in complex things about trying to detoxify the body and clean water and reduce stress. And so with the Rockefeller Foundation setting up medical schools and the licensing of the medical profession through those schools, they have more or less taken the Pasteur germ theory of the immune system and health, and that you can only really be healthy if you get prescribed a drug. And also now it has evolved in the last 50 years about vaccines. So they have also undermined the kind of connection between food and vitamins and nutrients in food, um, which is, there were like 10 Nobel prizes in the 50s, 60s and 70s for the discovery of vitamins, like vitamin D and C. And there was a lot of clinical trials and results to show that actually you can really recover people from even complex issues like sepsis or autoimmune disorders by giving high dose of vitamins and nutrients. And also a lot of ill health. We can even see now, if you look at the Amish population, where they don't have the same interaction with medical schools, that they, there's a lot of, we'll say, uh, metabolic syndrome and autoimmune diseases and cancer and neurocognitive decline issues and Alzheimer's that they do not have. So that's almost, there's 70,000 people there. That's like a control population for people who are eating very healthily and looking after their health and their immune system and they are in general healthy. So a lot of the issues coronavirus is bringing up and which Dr. Judy Mikovich and Dr. Sherry Tenpenny and Dr. Batar that you've interviewed are highlighting is that I think we're actually on a dawn of health because if this message gets through, you can actually recover people from a lot of current chronic illnesses by really looking at their nutrients and their balances of vitamins and you know, avoid a lot of the overprescription of drugs that often have associated adverse events. And also there are issues with the vaccines that they may be made with tissues, like from dog or from monkey, you know, simian viruses that actually are known to have oncogenes that can cause specific cancers or also irritate the immune system and cause autoimmune diseases. So I think what's the media battle that's going on is actually a battle around the health of the planet and that there are two different views, and one of them makes very little money. So I actually, in my political kind of point of view, would be thinking we actually need a new profession of health, you know, where people would pay into a system where they would not have any disease and not have any symptoms, and it might involve good nutrition and looking at their vitamin and nutrient status to be healthy. Right, almost get a cash bonus if you're, if you're healthy, right? Because you're not drawing down from that system. Um, exactly. And from what I understand, like, you know, all medical schools, I mean, to, to rise up in those ranks in medicine, you need to publish. And studies have to be funded by ultimately mostly pharmaceutical companies. So it's kind of maybe not always quid pro quo, but the whole profession, it's almost baked in to this almost benefactor, which are these people that provide these studies. And so whether it's intentional or not, everyone is around this industry of pharmacy and writing prescriptions and supporting these massive companies that end up paying for these doctors' entire careers. I mean, that is what, it's, what it looks like, right? Well, there is also, to be fair, you know, government funding agencies, you know, and where the governments like then the European Union actually fund a lot of these studies. But a lot of the time there are consensus, even in those committees that say, if you take a different, more holistic view on health, like I know there were studies done with the National Institute of Health funding and only 3% of their funding went to health and 97% of their funding went to disease. So you do have pharmaceutical companies that fund clinical trials, but also you do have government funding agencies and international agencies 
but a lot of the time they take their guidance by people who are high up in a profession that might have a worldview that doesn't really encompass health and no symptoms and elimination of disease. A lot of the time, chronic diseases are treated, but they're not really eliminated, you know? All right, well, I definitely want to get into vaccines and also talking about some of the vitamins, but I also just want to finish up with your censorship. Why were you censored? Were you surprised that a video was taken down of you actually speaking on like a network? I think it was YouTube. Um, why did that happen? Did you expect that was going to happen? And do you worry now when you put stuff out there? Well, I mean, I am always been a free speech advocate, but it was my, I think my first science interview, you know, I had given some small talks about encouraging freedom of speech with the Irish Freedom Party. But I think why I came out was that the Irish Medicines Organization about three days before on the 5th of May um, had come out and said they wanted to mandatorily vaccinate the total population of Ireland with this influenza vaccine. And sometimes, you know, in this crisis pandemic situation, I was afraid that the government would come out with that kind of a policy very quickly and it would be very difficult to roll back. So all I wanted to do was, which I just highlighted, um, about 10 slides that gave, first of all, the slide from the CDC to show that the level of the coronavirus had a sharp decline on the 17th of April. This was published by the director of the CDC. So essentially I was saying this is behaving like a normal flu virus. It's gone. We really don't need to take all these measures. But the second, the, the other slides then were around a series of animal studies and a study from the US military where they showed that if you have coronavirus in an influenza vaccine or a coronavirus itself, that there were serious consequences for the animals in those studies. So in one study, all of the animals got sick and some of them died. And in the US Army study by um, Dr. Wolf, he said that 36% of the American soldiers given the influenza vaccine that had corona in 2017, 2018, that 36% of them had adverse effects. And so that if they were going to vaccinate the total population of Ireland with this influenza vaccine containing dog material that had corona, you could be dealing with a huge epidemic of illness. The next time a coronavirus came along, or what I was afraid is if they vaccinated with influenza in the middle of a coronavirus pandemic, when people were locked in their houses, that when they would come out in the next week or two or whenever the lockdown is ended globally, that you could have huge deaths and huge people just collapsing because they would get this immune over response and cytokine storm and that the, the ill effects could be thousands of people. And people might say they weren't aware that this was predictable. So very few people in the world would actually make the connection between the vaccine for influenza and people collapsing with the coronavirus. So I just, not very dramatically, just wanted to go through the studies. And I mentioned the Irish Medicines Organization that I thought this was very unwise. And it was really uh, about 50 minutes of an interview with Dave Cullen on Computing Forever. And it was my first science one. And within six days, it got over 450,000 views on YouTube. And then it was taken down, which of course is huge reputational damage for me because it, you know you would think if you were banned from YouTube that you were saying something very wrong. But all I was doing was presenting results from the director of the CDC that anyone could access on the CDC website and just a number of publications, including one from Nature Medicine. Well, why do you think these are so popular, these ideas? Because, you know, like you said, 450,000 views. Um, you know, Dr. Buttar, six million views, nine million views, our videos tens and tens of millions of views. Why are, there's clearly a demand for this information out there. And yet at the same time, these technology platforms decide it's not okay to have this information public. What, what do you make of both of those things? Well, I suppose what I've been calling for is a public inquiry. You know, I did another interview with uh, Del Bigtree on the high wire, that actually if that individual people have to be held to account for censoring or not making available information that could keep people healthy and prevent deaths. So what I said in that video is I'm not saying I'm right. I could be wrong. 
and I would suffer rightly professional and reputational damage if I'm wrong. But if I'm right, and there's only very few immunologists who would be aware of the complexity of this issue, and that if genuinely the politicians weren't made aware of it, or the, the doctors or the Irish Medicines Organization or the families of people who could potentially die, then actually, if I'm right, censoring that information may result in deaths that are preventable. And so what I'm saying is the people who censor then have to actually, in a public inquiry format, have to be held accountable because that's actually malfeasance. Or, you know, in the medical profession, it's associated, you know, with misconduct. And for politicians and civil servants, it's malfeasance in public office or misconduct in public office. Because what they're doing by censoring the discussion and by, we'll say, the BBC or RTE or Channel 4 or News Talk in Ireland, not having people like me on to be debated and to be proved wrong, is that it could be that there are many, many deaths because of censoring the information. And I've been aware of this kind of issue for the last two years or so, well, many years, but that's why I decided that scientists need to actually stand for election and to open the debate about academic freedom and freedom of speech in society, because there will be unnecessary illnesses and incorrect policies if people like me don't speak out. Has your reputation been hurt since the video was banned? Well, I've been politely asked to remove myself from the, one of the uh, EU advisory boards. You know, it was a voluntary thing, but uh, they've asked me to step down. But to be fair, my employer have so far been very kind and uh, have you know, not mentioned it so far. But in a way, I felt, and I do feel that we have a moral and ethical responsibility that it doesn't really matter what happens to me because um, if I'm wrong, which I could be wrong, I will have to bear the consequences of reputational damage and professional damage. But if I'm right um, and the medical organizations go ahead with compulsory or mandatory vaccinations or encouraging people to take an influenza vaccine that potentially has this issue of dog tissue with dog coronaviruses that can cause cytokine storms for huge numbers of the population, then, then that would, could be thousands of deaths and I couldn't really live with that. It, it wouldn't be right. Yeah, this is such a serious issue, you know, and you mentioned being politely asked to be, to, to leave like, you know, certain associations. So I've been politely and impolitely asked to leave a lot of things recently. And it's been eye-opening, Dolores, to see it happen. You know, whether being completely uh, deplatformed and deleted from LinkedIn, to have our content and our account removed from Dropbox, which meant they were watching our videos on Dropbox, Vimeo, not to mention YouTube, deleting and banning our our massive live stream with David Icke, the second largest YouTube live stream in the world on April sixth. A video that would have gone. Oh, you did! Oh, fantastic! Uh, I mean, a video that would have gone on to be watched 30 million times easily if it had stayed on that YouTube channel. Again, deleted. And I've had intimate conversations with YouTube representatives who are censoring me. Um, now, what they told, what they said about that conversation, 24 hours later, when I finally got on the phone after they spoke to the BBC and told them what they did. Um, even though I was a partner there for eight years and, you know, had also made them a lot of advertising money, they didn't even call me. But I did finally have a conversation. They said, oh, he's a, a COVID-19 denier is what he said at this at the time. And I said, I said that's not true, actually. If you, it, it's, if you listen to everything he said, what you're doing is taking a soundbite and a clickbait headline and sticking it on what he said. Actually, what he said was this. The test brings up all sorts of random pieces of RNA. Some of that can false positively test for this. And I went to the whole explanation and they were like, no, COVID-19 denier. And also you mentioned 5G, which meant it's gone. Now, Dolores, we hadn't even mentioned the V word at that point. Now, when the vaccines came up, they saw my interview with Robert Kennedy, I think on this platform, and basically said to me, don't even think about putting that on YouTube. Because when the V word comes up, it almost takes what I thought was you know, a fascist level of censorship, the V word, it feels like it's 5X that, you know, um, and, and that even opened my eyes even more to the censorship. But you're right. I mean, this is, it's dangerous what they're doing. And it's, it's a few people in Silicon Valley saying, no, you can't do this and no, you can't do that. And these are our community standards, which I was told on the phone on Friday, oh, they change all the time and we don't even know what's in there. 
but you can't violate them or we're going to pull your channel down. So, I mean, that's a little bit what I'm dealing with in the background. And by the way, the last thing they said to me on Friday was, you are one video away from being completely deleted and deplatformed off of YouTube. That's almost 8,000 videos, nine years of content, a quarter of a billion views that has literally changed the lives of millions of people. By the way, a lot of times showing them how to eat better, move their bodies better, be more spiritual, be more loving, be more caring. You know, that's our content. And yet we've still struggled with that a little bit. So uh, that's what I'm dealing with here, Dolores. I don't know if we still have your video feed coming here. Let me just check my people here. Uh, Dolores, we might just check in there and, and check on your video. I know you've had a couple um, episodes in the past where we lost your stream. So uh, we'll just send you a message here. But uh, just for me to continue that thought, um, that's where we're at. And so I never understood the level of censorship that was out there uh, regarding vaccines. And um, it, you've been on the front lines with this, but it's, it's something that's very serious. And I'm starting to understand all of the strange forces involved, whether it comes to the status quo, to the medical community, to the pharmaceutical business, to all these other strange industries that somehow seem involved, including technology. And that's what's almost baffling to me, that a, a trillion dollar uh, search engine technology company might care about you speaking the truth about a vaccine. And so that's what boggles my mind. But I'm literally in the middle of that fight right now. And I know you are too. And I know you've already felt it. Um, so I'm sorry I'm late I to- I was aware of it. Yeah, so one yeah. of the reasons why I decided to enter politics was that when my daughter uh, was 11 or 12, she got the, uh, in, you know, the vaccine from the schools, but without the patient information leaflet. And of course, there is a, you know, a societal trust between the medical profession and doctors that you can only make a medical decision if you have full informed consent. And so with the information, there wasn't the patient information leaflet with the vaccine. And I immediately went to the next morning to the people who were given the vaccine saying, where is the patient information leaflet? This is wrong. And then when I looked into it, that uh, there were issues around Irish law and EU law that now no longer, because we were members of the European Union, that we were um, not given full informed consent. And that's why I decided it's time for me to actually dedicate, you know, 10 years of my life to ensure that people have informed consent. And the reason why they want to silence the discussion is that people do not have the information that vaccines are not safety tested and that they contain ingredients that in and of themselves are really toxic. So like 70% of the vaccines have aluminium and aluminium is a neurotoxin and I would never take aluminium. It should not be injected, it shouldn't be in the vaccine. And for decades, mercury, which is one of the most toxic substances on earth, was in vaccines given to babies and babies before nine months or a year cannot make antibodies. So they're given vaccines containing, they wear aluminum and mercury. So why they w don't want this discussion is that they want to say the current lockdown is going to be solved by a vaccine, but they don't want people raising questions about that the vaccines are not safety tested and that they actually might be the source of a lot of illnesses and symptoms like chronic fatigue. And that's why they are censoring and undermining reputationally people who are raising issues about the vaccine or that you can actually boost your immune system and be healthy without vaccines, because then that would undermine their business model. Who's they? Because is that the governments? Is that Google? Is that pharmaceutical companies? Or are they working in concert? I find it hard to believe that anybody can work in concert. So who is they? Do you think? Uh, that is a very good question. That is a very good question. So I suppose, you know, what we have to say is there are people of goodwill in the world and that individual doctors and nurses and people who work in government agencies and funding agencies and medical organizations probably went into that profession or into science or into media not wanting to do wrong things. But when you look behind a lot of the things that's going on, those people were not educated or it's very difficult for them to get the information. And that's why the patient information leaflet that I decided was for me a kind of a line in the sand that people have to know what's in these 
um, vaccines or medical interventions that they're getting, because by law on the patient information leaflet, it will have a list of what the adverse events are, which are like chronic fatigue or uh, multiple cirrhosis or juvenile arthritis. You know, there's a list of multiple diseases. And the reasons why people themselves and parents need to know is that if they don't know, and then it usually takes months for a child to go from being healthy, we we'll say to get multiple cirrhosis. If the parent don't, doesn't have the information, they won't make the connection. So they won't be able to get the right treatment for their child. And a lot of people feel let down because it takes them years before they make the connection. And then they realize, oh, if I had the patient information leaflet, I wouldn't have made that decision or I could have helped my child better. So that's about informed consent and access to information. So what's going on now is that it's almost like this lockdown is entirely unnecessary but the solution of it is to vaccinate. And so I don't exactly know the answer who they are, but they're compounding a solution to a problem. The problem itself is not necessary. It was responded to incorrectly. And the so-called solution to this problem may cause a huge amount of ill health. And there are politicians and the pharmaceutical industry, there are scientists and doctors and civil servants and journalists that all of whom are good people, but they're not, they don't actually know that there's a serious issue going on. They're not aware of it. They themselves don't have the information and they're now making it difficult for people like us to join the dots. And they are othering us, you know, by calling us deniers and putting, you know, words into our mouths that we haven't said and trying to undermine our reputations very successfully and intimidate us by not being able to earn a living. And that is as well so that other people who might themselves raise questions couldn't afford to be in a situation where they might lose their income and their professional standing and their standing in society. So it's a process of intimidation and lack of information. And I would say the people that really shouldn't, should know, and that's why we're talking about malfeasance, which is a crime, is that the ministers for health and the people in the head of these medical organizations. So malfeasance is, even if you don't know, or you say you don't know, you should have known. And so what we're people, why we're being censored is that if we get millions of views, then they cannot turn around and say, I wasn't aware of the issue, of the immune issue and adverse events associated with an influenza uh, vaccine. Because if it came to an inquiry or to a legal claim, people would say, well, you know, Dolores Cahal or people at Juvan have got 30 million views. You should have been aware. So it's in their interest to censor the information so that if there is an inquiry, that they can say, well, we weren't aware of those issues. So that's what's going on. Yeah, there's so many things you just said there that are powerful. I mean, first of all, that, that, that use of making you the others or people that, you know, anti-vaxxers are the others. And to wait to see the reaction uh, of mainstream media the way it's almost as if you're lepers, you know? And may, I, maybe I'm in this camp now too, maybe I joined your team, but you, know, uh, but you know, New York Times wrote an article about Judy Mikovits like a couple days after she was on our show. And I mean, it's almost like before they can finish the sentence, they're saying these crazies, like everyone knows they're crazy. It's just strange how they, they, put, they put those people in this weird box, or at least they used to. It seems like that's changing a lot. So that's one thing they do. Again, like you said, there's lots of interest. I never thought about that lack of liability interest. And um, I'm wondering, Dolores, if the next time I'm on the phone with YouTube, assuming I am, if I should tell them that, by the way, Dolores told me that you might be uh, in front of a criminal tribunal if you continue to censor me. So I might ask him that. Um, the next thing I want to talk about. And maybe I should just add that I have said in a number of interviews that, you know, there are different areas where people can personally be held to account. And I've been contacted by over 40 countries and I'm aware of more than in, in different con all continents in the world and seven different legal inquiries where they are taking either the president of the country under either their local law, like in Spain, or under common law. And why I think it's important for the YouTube, the people who are censoring, and also the civil servants, and the people who are running the health system, as well as the elected officials, 
that under common law and under criminal law of malfeasance or negligence or misconduct, that they can be individually liable, even if they are a middle ranking manager. Because for example, the FDA came out and prevented the use of hydroxychloroquine zinc as a treatment, or if YouTube are censoring preventions and treatments, that in individual countries, those CEOs, by preventing health information getting out, are contributing to unnecessary deaths. And I think it's important that we say it now in the middle of the censorship, because, and your platform is very valuable, because they need to know that they will be held to account, and there will be global inquiries and regional inquiries, and people will look back, because how you could easily do it is say, maybe less old people who lived in care homes die, right? Because then you would look and say, in Ireland, the HSE, or in the UK, did they give guidance to the elderly how they could boost their immune system? Did they give access to treatment? And whoever in those medical, either the owners of the care homes or the people in the health agency, the middle managers or regional managers, they can be held to account and the families of the people who die can actually hold them for either negligence or for contributory manslaughter. So it's quite serious what's going on. And I think why I'm coming out with these legal terms is that we want to nudge them to actually be truthful, say a mistake was made, the immune system can help you be healthy. There are prevention and there are treatments. And please try and you know, enforce those treatments now so that there will be less deaths now. And also the main thing is that we don't want this to happen again. We don't want them to have a playbook that every second year there's a virus, you know, or if there's an American election, or if there's a banking crash, that the playbook is we produce another virus and not that there is no prevention and treatment and we go through this lockdown again. Yeah, and we don't also want a playbook that censorship works and there's no one to be held accountable. So look, this is music to my ears. You know, when we raise money for the digital freedom platform that we're using right now to stream, we also raise money for the digital freedom defense fund. So we got teams in America and the UK now working on all sorts of different angles, some a frontal attack, some long-term planning, some Supreme Court things. But, but this is almost music to my ears, and I'm gonna play this for them and send them this clip right when we're done. The fact that, that individuals at those companies can be held liable, and, and you said something really interesting and for people that might wanna know is that since these are global platforms, you can try them on local law, which is fascinating. So, uh, for example- And also the CEOs are local, you know, the lady who's in Ireland in YouTube or whatever, and that families can sue them as well, you know? Because right. say if you had a young person that was a um, breadwinner, that died because they didn't get this information and that family would have lost an income, that those individual people who are censoring health information that turns out to be true, and it can be found to be true by doing analysis of people will say, like in Africa, they're on hydroxychloroquine as a preventative and they have less deaths, or people who are taking hydroxychloroquine and zinc for um, arthritis and lupus, it turns out that they're not dying. So that's kind of a controlled experiment in the middle of the pandemic. And if we're being censored, then those censors who are writing those emails, even the individual lower down people are actually contributing because under crimes against humanity in the Nuremberg, that you, you know, the codes that just because someone told you to do something, you should actually, if you're contributing to debts and preventing health information, that even more junior people can be held to account. And that's why we need inquiry so that this doesn't happen again and censorship should not um, you know, be an effective tool to prevent health information getting out. Yeah, and I like the way you're talking, and I know a lot of people listening will be like, wow, the gloves are off, and you guys are getting down and dirty and fighting dirty, but like, this is real. I mean, not having, being able to have an honest discussion about this stuff is changing science, it's changing public policy, and by definition, lives are gonna be lost, and you might not see them in front of you, but it's happening, and so it's, it is serious, and you have to use any means necessary to come after these people and have these basic freedoms respected because it's already changing who we are. The self-censorship is happening. People can't even say how they feel uh, in social situations on digital platforms, so that way the real science doesn't come out, and that's a crime. And I, I'm, I'm really, I'm glad you talked about that. And, and I suppose the other thing is that there is this, you know, climate of fear, as if we can't, you know, we cannot control our destiny and. That is actually very you know, undermining for younger generations and for children who are being made afraid of each other and not going to go to school and also afraid to interact with their grandparents. 
And also there, as we know, there will be illnesses because people will be, have, be poor, you know, in the months and years to come, there will be less taxes for the healthcare system. But also for the elderly, you know, there are a lot of deaths associated with loneliness. So in a way, the fear that's going on and the solution to the virus is actually cruel and inhumane. And they are trying to re-engineer society in a way that actually will take away a lot of the love and affection and interactions between the generations, and there will be more loneliness. So part of why it's important to push back on the solutions to this coronavirus that are societally based and will lead to people being more lonely and more depressed and not have work and not have money is that it actually people, when they find out, they will be outraged that this whole lockdown was not necessary and the solutions are entirely inappropriate and the societal ones are not based on any data. So I think it's incumbent on us to push back for free speech, but also to hold politicians and those who have sworn an oath to protect people and to keep them healthy, that they are failing those people and they do have to be held to account and we have to challenge it. Yeah, and some of the figures I heard, I think Robert Kennedy dropped on me in his episode was, you know, every 1% increase in unemployment in America will lead to 37,000 deaths another 4,000 in prison, and another 3,000 mentally ill. And, you know, this rate could go up 10% or 20%. We don't know. I mean, this is massively significant, and, and it's not being talked about. Um, not to mention, like you said, the whole generational factor of how uh, a generation is going to feel and interact with each other in the future. I mean, I decided eight or nine weeks ago, I put out a video at the time that got a lot of heat um, before I really knew much. This is probably in March even where I just said, uh, I'm ready to get it and I'm ready to take my chances and I'm gonna I'm a, I feel healthy and I just, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to do it. So I